Good afternoon and welcome today to today's conversation, which is a really historic one. It's about the reflection on the stand in the schoolhouse door. My name is Dr. Christine Taylor and I serve as the Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and Associate Provost. We wanna welcome you into today's conversation. Uh, let me just say it's been incredible to have an opportunity to work on this project and I want to give some special recognition to one of the groups that helped in this and that is the Tuscaloosa Civil Rights History and Reconciliation Foundation. Uh, their website is civilrightstuscaloosa.org and uh, they currently are working on many issues dealing with civil rights in our community, but most importantly, there now is a serious uh, Tuscaloosa Civil Rights Trail. And if you've not had an opportunity to participate in that, I really encourage you to do that because it very much parallels with the conversation that we're going to be having today, which is about the stand in the schoolhouse door. Uh, to say that I'm excited is, is an understatement. And let me uh, share with you who our two guests are today that are going to help us get a better understanding of what happened, what are the events that led to the stand, as well as some things that happened afterwards. And from a, a housekeeping point, we're gonna leave about 10 minutes at the end of our conversation from questions and answers from you. And you can simply put them in the chat room and we'll try to get uh, our participants an opportunity to answer them. Let me first start by telling you who's, who's in the house, if you will. I'm so honored to welcome Dr. E. Culpepper, or Cully Clark, who is the author of The Schoolhouse Door, Segregation's Last Stand at the University of Alabama. This book was named a notable book by the New York Times Book Review. He's a native of, South Georgia, of, a South, of a South Georgia town of Cairo. Dr. Clark received his undergraduate and master's degree in history at Emory University and then went on to get his PhD at the University of North Carolina. Dr. Clark is Dean Emeritus of the Henry W. Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communications at the University of Georgia. Before going to the University of Georgia, he had been at the University of Alabama for 27 years and spent his last years at UA as the Dean of the College of Communications and Information Sciences. His retirement from the University of Georgia marked 47 years as a teacher and education administrator. A historian of the South since the Civil War, his published works have focused on the New South movement and civil rights. So we thank you, Dr. Clark. My other guest today is Dr. Arthur, or Art N. Dunning. He is a three-time graduate of the University of Alabama. He is the immediate past president of Albany State University. Now, prior to his work at Albany State, he served as senior research fellow and professor at the University of Alabama in 2013 and vice chancellor for international programs and outreach for the University of Alabama system between 2010 and 2012. He's had several executive positions in higher education, including Senior Vice Chancellor for Human and External Resources, Vice Chancellor for Services and Acting Executive Vice Chancellor at the University System of Georgia. He's also served as a Chief Executive Officer of Georgia Partnership for Excellence in Education. During Dr. Dr. Dunning served two years in Taiwan with the U.S. Air Force before matriculating to the University of Alabama in 1966. He was one of about 15 African Americans on the campus in the mid 1960s and came during the second class after uh, at the campus uh, welcomed Malone and Hood. In fact, he and four of his friends walked on at Paul, Bryant, Paul Bear Bryant's spring football practices. Dr. Dunning's ties to the university run deep. He chaired the 50th anniversary committee of the university's Through the Door celebration honoring the lives of Vivian Malone Jones and James Hood, as well as authoring Lucy Foster. Thank you both so much uh, for coming today and being a part of this conversation. As I've thought about our time, this is about not only Brown v. Board, it's about civil rights, it's about the history of the University of Alabama, it's about diversity in higher education, uh, it's about all the things that we're working through today as a nation, and, and I'm so looking forward to, to, to having the conversation. I'd like to start with you, Dr. Clark, if you could help our audience who perhaps does not have the understanding about 
exactly what happened on this historic day, on June 11th, this very day, 57 years ago, when Vivian Malone and James Hood were trying to um, come to the University of Alabama, we have this historic stand in the schoolhouse door, which is now part of almost every civil rights movie that you see in the nation. Bring our audience up to speed about what's happening in the background when all this is going on, please. Well, I can tell you where I was and what I was doing. I was at Emory in, on June 11, uh, 1963. I was a sophomore at that time, and I was very interested in what was happening in Tuscaloosa, paying close attention to it. And while I was working cash register in Cox Hall uh, to sort of help pay my way through college, uh, I had plenty of time to go back to my dorm, listen to the radio, watch some of the television footage that was being displayed about that stand in the schoolhouse door. And um, so it was very personal to me. And um, I also know where I was when Operating Lucy was going through her peril at the University of Alabama. I was in South Georgia, Cairo it is pronounced. Cairo, thank you. Right. The Cairo High School syrup makers, as a matter of fact, and we're uh, as far south as you can get in Georgia without being in Tallahassee. Birthplace of Jackie Robinson. So I'm not from nowhere. Got you. You're from some great places. <laughs> In any event, uh, that, uh, that time and that moment when I was 12, soon to turn 13, uh, was gripping for me. And the truth is, is that when I came to Alabama, uh, what year was it, Mary, that you came over? 1971. Um, as I drove into Alabama, uh, I knew there was a book I was going to write mm -hmm. and it would be about authoring Lucy and James Hood and Vivian Malone. And uh, I had that opportunity and uh, it's been one of the great pleasures of my life because I got to interview so many people who were part of it, experienced it, uh, knew what happened very well, like Art Dunning. Uh, and so that gave me a rich body of oral history to, you know, transfuse and inspire the written documents that I also plowed through. Uh, and uh, that gave me an opportunity to tell a very important story, and that's the story of Arthurine Lucy, Vivian Malone, and James Hood, and what they did to change the University of Alabama forever better. Yes. So, so, it, but it strikes me that it didn't just change the University of Alabama because we see the footage from the stand in the schoolhouse door of this historic date some 57 years ago. Right. And it put in the context of many civil rights documentaries or movies. But so could you give us a, a high level view of what this case meant about diversity in terms of where we're able to move in diversity in higher education it, from, from your research? Yeah. Well, the, th the interesting thing is how long it took to take effect. Uh, for example, the schoolhouse door was June 11, 1963, and Art can testify to this as I, as I can, uh, but we did not make meaningful progress on integration, that is getting a sufficient number of African Americans until at least five years later. Mm -hmm. uh, so when Art came there in 1966, he had very few cohorts who were African-American, and it took time for all of that to develop. In fact, it took time for all of the integration of 
education from K through 12 up through higher education uh, to really get traction. And uh, I date that traction to around 68 when things began to pick up uh, and move in the right direction right. for higher education. So Dr. Dunning, you were here in the year after Vivian Malone came and James Hood. Could you talk a bit about your um, ideas, what you had heard about this experience and your ideas and decision to come to the University of Alabama? I was not even 20 years of age when this happened in 1963, but I was off the coast of China on an island called Taiwan. And I was serving in the United States Air Force, uh, 19 years of age. And I worked a midnight shift and I had to stop by the gun room to turn in an M2 carbine and a 38 Smith and Wesson. And my habit was after I finished the midnight shift and turned those weapons in, I would stop by the base library. Mm -hmm. Two or three documents I would read, New York Times, Atlanta Constitution, Time Magazine, and on the cover of Time was a Vivian Malone walking near Denny Chimes with the U.S. Marshal. And it occurred to me what was happening when I was out of this country. You had Medgar Evers being shot, Kennedy being assassinated, Kelly Ingram Park, dogs and fire hoses, and the four girls in uh, Birmingham. During that 63 time period, as a 19 year old, I was very much seething about the whole thing back here. So when I got out of service, I had the Vietnam era GI Bill, and that GI Bill allowed me to come to a state university and have some resources left. So when I arrived on campus in June, I think June 6th, 1966, I was here five weeks before I saw another African-American student, and I was walking across the quad and saw a person who waved at me. But my first introduction, I got out of Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery on a Friday afternoon. And on Monday, I was on campus living in Patey Hall. I was walking from the Student Union Building, which is at the time is where Reese Pfeiffer is right now. I stopped by the post office to open up to get a box. And I was walking down the campus on the west side of the quad in front of Graves. And I walked on down to near Morgan Hall. Someone yelled a racial slur out of the uh, top floor of Morgan Hall and used the N-word and said, go home. And I was kind of amused about that because at that time I had come back to see my family in the Alabama Black Belt. And I very much embraced the culture back at home, the cuisine, the music, the lineage, the extended family, and hear the racial slurs. And I, what made me so amused about it, I thought, I really am back at home. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't bother me at the time. I just kept walking. Mm -hmm. I took classes in Tenhur and Morgan Hall, but where most of uh, my classes were held at the time. But it was complete isolation socially. On Friday nights, the six or eight students went to Stillman College. And since I was a little older, there's one thing that I really have enjoyed all my life is Southern Blues. And I went used to go to a place called the Citizens Club down on Utah Highway. So Alabama University is almost like a job. I came to take classes, but not to get integrated fully into the social aspect of the campus because of the sheer isolation. I was a third year student before anybody sat by me in a classroom. And I was in 10 who were on the ground floor. I so, so, distinct. Could you pause a second? So you're in a class. How many students would have been in that classroom? Just guess, about, guessing. About 25 students. And no one would sit beside you? The one sat by me. And what you have the front seat, the seat in the side, seat in the back. So it was almost a little circle around you. And then in the third year, someone finally sat by me in a classroom. But now I want to give you some context about this. I had been in a barracks two years with some very earthy and profane guys called US Airmen. <laughs> and I was not at all bothered by that because I'd seen the most up close and personal issues of how people felt about race, history, and culture back at home in the United States of America. And my job was to come to the University of Alabama, as I felt at the time, was to get a college degree. And there was one thing that I think your listeners should notice 
uh, should, should know and understand. It was so clear to me that Jim Crow could not be sustained. I wish we had been able to say to people who were pushing back, this thing is over. We're not going to sit by with a legal system of 100 years any longer. And Johnson at the time had just he signed 1964 Civil Rights Act. But nothing changed in Alabama because he signed that document. But what was clear to me, the young African-Americans that I spent time with, it was clear that we were not going to abide by those rules any longer. And I sensed the tipping point at times that we, I'm feeling now about this present issue that's going on across this country. So I came as a 22-year-old, as a freshman to Alabama in June of 1966. And for many 18 years, they thought I was an old man <laughs> because I'd been in the military and four years older. So that's the context of what was going on from my experience at that time. Wow. So, you know, you spoke earlier that you, about the difference in terms of how you saw yourself when you were in Taiwan as compared to how you felt about yourself here in the U.S. I felt when I left the U.S. and flew out of San Francisco at age 18, I felt no ownership of Alabama, I felt no ownership of the country. But I was part of the draft generation. Nixon ended the draft. But for Southern African American men, that was how you left the region. But when I came back, it was almost uh, an experience that I can't describe. I came back feeling very Southern, feeling very Alabama, and feeling very America. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because that's how I was treated in Taiwan. I had never experienced liberty and freedom. But on that island, I could stay in a hotel, I could go to Taipei, I could go to bookstores, go to restaurants. But back at home, I had to navigate through Jim Crow laws. So I forever have felt passionate about that part of the world. When I finished my master's at Alabama, I went back to Bangkok for two years as a civilian this time around. But what gave me ownership was how people the Taiwanese defined me. They defined me as an American, as an airman. And I started to embrace those identities. But when I left with Jim Crow and marginalization and subjugation by laws, policies, practices, and customs in the Alabama Black Belt, which is where I grew up, my mom and dad were school teachers. And I was a voracious reader and had a keen instinct about what I was seeing. And so when I came back after two years, I had been repositioned intellectually and emotionally about all of this. Right. Thank you. D Dr. Clark, let me ask a question about um, this historic event with respect to its relationship to the civil rights movement. The other night I was looking at um, something on the History Channel focused on this period of time and, and they discussed um, the stand in the schoolhouse door and the speech that President Kennedy gave and that work that ended up having to be completed by uh, President Johnson. But, but, but I'd like you to speak a bit, if you will, about how the stand in the schoolhouse door here, here at the University of Alabama began to set the stage for the development and completion of that segment of the civil rights movement. All right, I'll get to that. Let me start though by talking, following up on what Art said. Certainly. Uh, Vivian Malone also was very much isolated and alone on campus. And um, she was purposefully uh, escorted by University of Alabama over to Stillman for an improved social life for her. And as a matter of fact, her husband today, Mac Jones, was a Stillman student and became her driver to and from Stillman to the university and back and forth. Uh, so that's how they met and uh, lived happily ever after. And, uh, but uh, it was a very isolating time. And again, it would be another five years before you would have begun to get something of a surge in African-American enrollments at the University of Alabama and meaningful steps towards a more integrated environment. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to mention that. Right, thank you. Yeah, and um, your question was to the- The, the symbolic, yes, how the stand of the schoolhouse door, what the president, 
Kennedy had to do on that day and how it then parlayed into the undone business or unfinished business, if you will, that got picked up with President Johnson. So, so talk about how this historical- well, uh, John Kennedy was very much involved uh, through his brother, Robert. And Robert was on site and down here working, working, working to advance the cause and to make it possible uh, to remove the barrier of segregation in the state of Alabama through its university. And uh, so there's a great correspondence in the Kennedy papers about the schoolhouse door and Bobby's regular uh, correspondence with John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And uh, so it is an important part of the story. And uh, as I noted earlier, what happened in 63 would take root in 68 and begin to really move the civil rights movement forward. But 63 had to happen first because it was sounding the death knell to segregation and it rang loud. And it had roots that went forward. But as I say, it took a while for things to begin to really coalesce, but it started. And that was important. So, so let me ask a question. That you said you did a lot of oral history to gather the information for your book. What is, are there things that people would be surprised to know? So there is the story, but there are perhaps undercurrents that people might be surprised to know that you discovered in your research around the time of the stand in the schoolhouse door? Uh, yes, the uh, things that would be of most interesting was when I would be interviewing former members of the White Citizens Council. So talk about the White Citizens Council. And the White Citizens Council, of course, was the organization designed to push back against desegregation. It was a white supremacist group. And uh, I interviewed a number of those people to measure their temperament, their times, what they thought today, and many of them hadn't changed. Uh, one of the arch people that resisted desegregation at the University of Alabama lives about 40 miles northwest of Tuscaloosa. And I went to his home. And when I went into his home, he had one wall of books that were loaded up with civil rights literature. And he had another wall of books that was loaded up with segregationist literature. And he looked at me and kind of winked and said, see, they don't even meet here. Oh, wow. That's the kind of guy he was. But uh, he was a real rabble rouser. And I, I do have him in the book. Uh, so that people can see what that mindset was and how it operated to disturb what was taking place uh, in Tuscaloosa University of Alabama. Dr. Dunning uh, talked about the students that he was there on campus with, uh, and, and I would have, I would assign them the name of foot soldiers, that they were folks who who just, they too had a part, they were foot soldiers in this whole process. What was your, what, what were the things that you learned from the African-American community as you were doing the research for the book? What was the temperament there? This is, is that Dakali? Yes, it's for Kali, uh -huh. Dr. Clark, what was their, what was their temperament for uh, members of the African-American community when they began? when you were doing the research? What was my sentiment about? No, 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 what was, what were you learning from the African-American community? How were they looking at what was about to happen? And, and, and let me give this a personal reference because I was a kid who integrated the first grade in 1963 in Tennessee. There were a whole bunch of people in our community that were like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, mostly because of my safety. And then there were others who were saying, yes, go forward. Yes, go forward. So I'm interested in what you learned about how the community was 
feeling about it? How are people in the state responding to this? And what was that larger strategy? I learned a lot. And yes, there was that push and pull phenomenon going on in the African-American community. Some saying, don't do it. Some saying, go for it and let's get it. And, uh, you know, but most of the sentiment, I think, would have coalesced around support for what was taking place in the desegregation of the University of Alabama, particularly, but all over the state. And, um, but uh, I've got loads of interviews with African Americans who experienced it, testified to it. You know, I just became great friends with Arthurine Lucy and her family and, her daughter Grazia came to the University of Alabama while I was still there, and uh, I got to know her real well. And then other members, Hugh Lawrence Foster, who was Arthurine's uh, husband and a wonderful minister in Birmingham, uh, th that made a real difference for me. And of course, interviewing the principals in the schoolhouse door. Uh, episode and all that sort of stuff meant the world to me as well. I learned an enormous amount about how people felt about going forward and uh, the courage that it took. Yes. I mean, it was a lonely experience on that university campus uh, that, you know, Caused Vivian to have to go over to Spel uh, Spelman. Stillman. Yes. So, Dr. Dunning, you clearly uh, exhibited that courage. Uh, and, and I'd like perhaps you to talk about um, what in it, what in you compelled you to move forward um, in the midst of the isolation you talked about, the racial slurs that you received. What was the driver for you? I think my, my sense of history. I'll give you an example of two people. Some people on campus may know these names, but Jay and Alberta Murphy. I remember inviting Joe Malishan to talk to eight or 10 students at Williams Restaurant, which is a restaurant near Stillman College. All the UA students went over there. We invited two people to speak to us, Joe Malishan and T.Y. Rogers. And one of the things that Malishan said that really struck a chord with me. Will you share with people who may not know who he is? Joe Malisham was a Korean War veteran, and he was a civil rights leader and served on this kind of commission, I think, when they made the change. He was the first African American. But he was a really strong advocate for change in Tuscaloosa. Mm -hmm. And T.Y. Rogers was a young minister at First African uh, Baptist Church. And what we were looking for, we felt at times fatigued. And we looked for people who could come in and speak to us to give us broader contacts as young students. T.Y. Rogers talked about this sort of change across America, change across the South, and our role as young people in being successful students. Joe Malisham was more um, we won't change, but we're going to protect ourselves. He mentioned to me that when Alberta Murphy, who's married to Jay Murphy, a law professor at the University of Alabama, would meet with them to help them do work, civil rights, and to get them out of jail, that she would drive home sometimes late from those meetings. He said, two of us would follow her. And he said, I don't think she ever knew this, but we would follow her to make sure she got home mm -hmm. and we had shotguns. Mm -hmm. And so I felt at the time, I had this context that I was not going to live my life after serving this nation mm -hmm. on a system called Jim Crow. I was not going to do that. I didn't know how that was going to play out. And so when I stepped on the University of Alabama campus, it was almost child's play considering what was in my mind and what I had experienced in East Asia. And I'll give you one more example of what happened in 63. I was asleep one morning and a Taiwanese young boy who kept our barracks clean, he came and touched me on the shoulder and said, the American president has been shot. And I thought, what is he talking about? Mm 
-hmm. Kennedy had been assassinated. Mm -hmm. I walked out in the hallway. And there were two American airmen clapping and said, we got the SOB, we got the SOB. And one was from Mars, Georgia, and the other was from Huntsville, Alabama. And what they were happy about, that Kennedy was promoting civil rights and he had been assassinated. That said to me as a young, less than 20 years of age, how profound the fault line is in the South. Mm. When I walked to the University of Alabama campus, I had all of that context in my head. And I recognized that we were in the sort of pulsating death of the Jim Crow system, because all the African-American students I knew on that campus felt the same. We're not going to do this any longer. Our parents had to deal with this. Our grandparents had to deal with this. And 80% of the time of African-Americans in this country has been under either slavery or legal segregation. Both of those systems are designed to drop, to grind exceptionality out of you. Mm -hmm. It was, they are designed to grind any exceptionality you feel about yourself. But we were done with that. And so that was what was kind of around me when I was walking across the floor and somebody yells out a racial slur. Mm -hmm. it was well, that's, um, that's so important the way you put it. Uh, I get it and understand it completely. Um, I too remember the day Kennedy was shot. And, um, you know, the sad thing in the county that I grew up in is he won the county by a landslide because Southern Democrats were still voting for Democrats. <laughs> but when he was assassinated, cheers went up in schools all around my county. I wasn't there. I was at Emory when that happened. Um, but that's what took place. I mean, it was a transformation in Southern attitudes, white Southern attitudes towards the Kennedys that started very supportive and wound up cheering his death. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the impact that his support of civil rights with his brother Robert at his right side, mm -hmm. and uh, and together they were bringing about a civil rights revolution through executive leadership. And um, people in my home county didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dunning, I, I want to ask you a, another question about um, how you and your colleagues walked on to Paul Bear Bryant's spring football practices. Talk to us a bit about that. When I read that, I was like, all right. <laughs> the rumors that circulated. Be honest. <laughs> oh, I, I'm gonna be honest about it. One of the rumors that circulated through the small African-American population of the University of Alabama, that one of the assistant coaches allegedly said, he did not ever foresee your day that a Negro would have the athletic ability and academic ability to play football for the University of Alabama. He just didn't see that any time in the future. So the five of us had played in high school. I played at a small 1A school. And I think out of the five, maybe three had deep interest in playing on the team. I was one of the two that has sharp elbows, that there's no sacred space in a racial caste system any longer. <laughs> I'm not going to be part, if you're saying that's, so my job out there was to go on that team, no intention of staying, but it was to, was to help disintegrate and to break down any racial caste system and hereditary advantage. I was done with people having a hereditary advantage on the racial caste system. So when they, Coach allegedly said they don't have the skills academically, athletically. The myth of that, we all chuckle about that. So we walked on in the spring of 67, and Coach Bryant was up in the tower. Kenny Stable was quarterback. Uh, I walked in the room, the dressing room, about 80 guys. The whole room just got silent as soon as I walked in. Mm. Remember a man named Sam Bailey? I have 
I had been clean shaven for four years. I had grown a mustache. And Sam Bailey gave me a raise and said, if you're going on this speed, you have to cut that thing off. And uh, I amuse and laugh about this when I think about it now. I thought, I've been waiting four years to do this. This is a high price to pay just to walk on this field. <laughs> but we walked on, the, on that field to make, a, to make sure there's no sacred space around racial advantage. That was, that was what was going through my mind at the time. And it was all on the news. We got interviewed. And at the time, there were only three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. And I think they were all out there, no cable networks at the time. And we spent some time, all of us, being interviewed after we walked off the practice field. And I think three of the players stayed through spring practice, one stayed through the fall. But after about two or three weeks, I decided my, my goal is to get a, a bachelor's degree from the University of Alabama. I made the statement. And now I'm done with this. I moved on uh, to get back to my studies. But that was the purpose of it, of walking on that field. We knew Alabama football was a big deal then, and it is now. Mm -hmm. so if we walked on, it was going to get a lot of attention. Right. Lot of attention. And that's what happened. I'd like to ask, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Clark, in what way uh, do you, s let's talk about that actual day. And you said you interviewed a lot of the people that were there on the day of the stand in the schoolhouse door. Could you walk us through the events of the day and all the things, the intricacies, and I, and I would encourage people if you've not read the book, it, it's quite fascinating. And I love the way that you've documented this story. But could you share with us um, the events of that day, and what are all the pressure points that were happening on that day? Mm -hmm. Well, there were a lot of different pressure points. Uh, uh, it was very difficult to assess what the white students were going to do. By and large, they either maintained a respectful distance or applauded when they saw Vivian Malone or James Hood on their way to Foster Auditorium. Now, the auditorium was encircled by, uh, you know, State Patrol, uh, National Guardsmen. So there was a lot of, in effect, armed presence military to keep the peace and to keep order. Uh, the thing that is vivid to me most about that is through it all, there comes Vivian Malone and James Hood, and they are walking steadily and straight towards that <laughs> schoolhouse door. And there stands Wallace right in the middle of that door, in effect, playing like a traffic cop, telling them to stop. And, uh, but, uh, and they did for a moment. But what happened then was General Henry Graham came up and told Wallace, he said, it is my sad duty to ask you to leave. And Wallace left. And as he walked away from the schoolhouse door, Vivian Malone and James Hood went right on through and went through registration. Uh, they were alone. The other students weren't registering on that day and at that moment. But they had the whole uh, Foster Auditorium basketball facility to themselves, and the registrars and faculty were there to enroll them in their classes, and everything happened wonderfully well. They went to their dorms. Um, in fact, earlier, because Wallace had ringed the auditorium uh, with his cronies and all, uh, they went straight to the dorms and walked into those dorms and went to their floors and unpacked. Mm -hmm. And then they came back to the schoolhouse door and went in and registered. Mm -hmm. This is such a fascinating, uh, fascinating, uh, intimate understanding of what was happening on the campus, both from a historian's perspective, as well as from a person who was 
was there within a year of the stand in the schoolhouse doors. So, so I do want to ask the folks that are in the audience, if you've got a question, we've got about 15 minutes left to our conversation. Please put those in. But, but I want to take that historic event and fast forward to our thinking, and both of you have been distinguished higher education leaders. Um, as you reflect on where we are nationally in higher education and tying it to that historic day, the stand in the schoolhouse door, which happened 57 years ago on this day at the University of Alabama, uh, what are your thoughts? What are you thinking? And maybe even if you want to put that in the context of what we're dealing with as a nation right now, because one of the things that one of you said that there was a sense that systems were not going to change. And I think Dr. Dunning, it was you, but you were, if, if I can use a Tennessee phrase, flat-footed in your determination with your peers that things were going to change, that you were going to keep moving and not let the system uh, stop you that had been put up in place. i just like you to reflect a moment in terms of higher education and where we are, given your experiences as a historian, as a participant in that process. And, and Dr. Dunning, perhaps if you'd like to go first, and Dr. Clark, we'll, we'll go with you next. Okay. I think they are two things that I think about is what's happening now feels very different for me. And I go back to the time when I was 18 years of age, 19 years of age, how young people, how we felt almost no fear and that we understood the system and understood how wrong the system was. It almost had a political stench to it. So at age 18, we had nothing to lose. And people were being harmed on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They were being harmed in Marion, Alabama, places like Greensboro and Utah. But they were out there. I think if there's one thing that comes to my mind so clearly is the energy that people are bringing to something that's so egregious. And what was nagging at us, the students at the University of Alabama. And I'll give you an example. I flew back and landed in San Francisco after being in Taiwan at age 20 and flew from San Francisco to New Orleans and got on a bus to stop in Biloxi, Mississippi. And when I got off, I looked up and saw a colored waiting room and white waiting room. I spent two years away from that. I looked at that and I thought, I'm not doing this. I am not going to do this. Mm -hmm. And so I sense things that we can learn is that the energy of young people behind some of these changes that they are pushing, that's going to happen. And one of the things I'm so hopeful about, and, and I worry about my home state, people can differ on a lot of things, but the South and Alabama on the wrong side of the Civil War, they were on the wrong side of civil rights. And at some point, you're going to have to understand it's hard to manage a multiracial democracy if you think you can exclude people because of certain aspects of who they are. It just is not going to add up. And we have a demographic destiny that's in our place right now, the changing profile of America. And I think that people who think this is not going to happen. I think there were people in the 60s who felt civil rights would not happen, that these changes that occurred with Johnson and the voting rights. I think we've hit a tipping point. I probably may have a better historical perspective, but I'm feeling something very different about this. It's just reminding me of, of the time in the 60s. So I think that's, if our students at the University of Alabama, and we had this at the university, there were about four or five faculty members at the university that we consider allies. Mm -hmm. Work got around among the eight or ten students. These five or six faculty members, they are helpful, they're thoughtful, they are kind, and you need to get to know them. So I would say to students, any change that you're thinking about bringing about, I would say there are three things you need, collaboration, cooperation, and leveraging relationships. Because we didn't do anything around these issues unless we had that. Martin Luther King had that. The Kennedys, Johnson. And I understand that Johnson said to Martin Luther King, "What can I?" The King said, "What can I do to help you?" 
He said, stay in the streets and keep pressure on me. Keep pressure on the government. And he allegedly mm -hmm. said mm -hmm. that. And so I think the, the notion of alliances and, co and coalitions makes a lot of sense to me. Yes, thank you. Dr. Clark, how would you respond to that? Well, I just, uh, the movement liberated me. Uh, it gave me the right to choose anyone I wished for a friend. Uh, it opened doors for me uh, to experience what all others experienced and, uh, you know, add it to the total of my own experiences. So I was just liberated by the uh, civil rights movement, desegregation, integration, and uh, I have watched uh, the progress of it. I remember when there was early pushback from white students that continued five, six, seven years into the 70s, uh, but it began to melt. And uh, when it did, it went away, that negative sentiment. Uh, and I just think the world is so much better off for what uh, my African-American friends endured in order to make it a better place. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I've got a grandson over here right now who navigates a world that is just uh, totally beyond. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's fraught with, he's went to one of the most integrated high schools in uh, Atlanta, Parkview. And uh, it wasn't always peaches and cream, but it was a great school and with great outcomes for all the students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are the kinds of things that I think are victories. And they would not have occurred absent what my African-American friends did to liberate themselves and therefore me. Let me just follow up a bit on, on that comment that you made that you said after doing the research in the book that you had the freedom to have any kind of friend that you wanted to have that perhaps you hadn't sensed that before. And, right. and I, I think part of what you're what I understand you to say is that you may have perceived there were boundaries of connecting with people who are different than you. And, and for folks who may have a similar sort of feeling, um, because one of the pieces that's come up with this nationally in light of the recent national events is how do I get involved? How can I be helpful? And, and for people who have not found themselves um, being um, one, one of a, a many or, or have never really taken the time or the energy to connect with people that are different, it can sometimes be a little overwhelming people that are diverse, that, that's a part of your life. That's part of what you have to do. So perhaps you could speak about that as, as it relates to our ability to be able to work more collaboratively together, whether we're talking about in our community, our campus, what, what words would you give from your experiences doing the interviews and writing your book? Mm -hmm. Well, I will give you one picture of that. Uh, when the book came out, I was in... Roger Sayers' office, the president of the university, as his executive assistant. And uh, I went to him and I said, this is not going to go down very well and you may want to look for another executive assistant. Because there were things that I exposed about what people who were important to the university had done that would embarrass them today or then, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and I knew it, right? because, but I couldn't tell the story and not tell it like it was. You gotta be truthful. And uh, gotta be truthful, and so in being truthful, I knew that there were important alumni who were going to feel a little abused by what I exposed in the book. Uh, and uh, so it was not comfortable, 
But you know, the interesting thing is, I never got any feedback from those I felt like were going to have some real problems with it. Mm -hmm. No one ever came to me and said, you shouldn't have said that about my mom and dad. You shouldn't have said that about my uncle. You shouldn't have said that about my friends. Uh, I never, ever got that kind of feedback. And uh, most of the people who read it uh, uh, thought it did a good service to what had gone on and transpired and how it affected all the people involved and how it had ramifications for a much better University of Alabama than it would have been without having gone through desegregation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Dunning, I, I'd like to ask you to, to speak, if you will, to um, what advice you would give to young people moving forward, um, whether we're talking about, uh, because I, I do think even today, uh, and I'm speaking now very broadly and generally, as, as you look at the, the research and the data about life for diverse students at predominantly white institutions, some of the same themes that you spoke about in terms of your own personal experience still persist today. And so clearly um, institutions are working to make these more welcoming and inclusive places. That's in part why I have the role that I have here at the campus. But uh, what would you recommend for students um, who perhaps are walking um, in the same space, not to the same degree that you've experienced while you were here as a student, but what, what words of wisdom would you offer to them? And also to those of us who are um, leaders and administrators and supporters for all of our students here at the University of Alabama? I think the use of, a, of your voice. I remember 10 of us, almost the entire African-American population went to see President Rose in Carmichael Hall, Frank Rose. Mm -hmm. And what was agitating us, we watched a homecoming float that had an old South theme. The women on the float wore antebellum skirts and the guys wore Confederate uniforms. They had gotten six or eight young black kids from Tuscaloosa to get on the float to fan them while they were sitting. And so this float was coming down University Boulevard during homecoming. A couple of us stood there and watched that with these young boys fanning these uh, students with an old South theme. We went to see Dr. Rose about that. And in the office, he had a, a young assistant named David Matthews, who was sitting in there taking notes, who eventually became the president of the University of Alabama. What we said to Dr. Rose, sir, there are two views of Southern history. And that may be your view, but as African-American students, that's not the portrayal of us as students at the University of Alabama. So the concept of a voice. Students need to find their voice around these issues. I think university administrators should help facilitate growth and development intellectually around these issues of a diverse nation, a multiracial nation. How do you help them know what they're going to face when they get out, not just the academic side, but given the concept of wars to bring about organizational change. And I felt at the time, and I think it was more of Dr. Rose's personality that it was somewhat patronizing. And what I said in that meeting is that it's unlikely we'll ever reconcile Southern history because we have two views of the South but we can expect to have some dignified space and a Southern scene with slavery tied to it is not what we would like to see as students at the University of Alabama. And we got on his agenda, on his calendar, he listened to that. And at some point it stopped. I don't know what he did with it. I have no idea about that, but what we brought to that process was a voice. So I think university administrators should provide safe space to hear student voices, safe spaces for students to have their voices heard. And it's part of what I consider the growth experience. I felt all the time at the University of Alabama, we were pushing against sort of a tide. And 
we found in, in the Cully would perhaps know these names, but John Blackman, I think Jeff Bennett, the names that I remember, uh, that people were not pushing to, to support you by everything you say, but at least that was a level of kindness. And so we were able to find that out and they helped us with our voice around this. So my advice to students is to find that voice and to university administrators help facilitate that in ways where it strengthens the university experience. Now, Blackburn and Bennett were uh, favorites of mine, for sure. And uh, one other just note on what you were saying. I think the sororities and fraternities at the University of Alabama, white, uh, were bad business for the development of race relations on campus. Uh, they had those Old South themes that you mentioned, and uh, they, in their parades, would do offensive things as they were trooping from their fraternities over to the stadium for a football game. They would shout things that uh, were gross, vulgar. And um, they kind of perpetuated some of that, quote, Old South stuff. It wasn't Old South. It was Southern white stuff. And um, there you have it. I think Greek system was a retardant on progress. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, as, I, as I'm learning that our, that our systems have moved uh, to, to make a change on, on the campus. And the good thing I think um, that I've said since I've gotten here to our campus is that we do have a history, but the good news is that we can talk about, look where we have come since then. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, I think the message we wanna focus on is look where we're going to go in terms of making sure that all of our students understand the importance of accurate history, understand the importance of cultural competencies, and really can operate in a powerful way in a world, as Dr. Dunning has already talked about, that's going to be increasingly diverse and increasingly global. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of the educational imperative that our students leave our institutions, and this is across the nation, ready to operate in, in that world and that experience because you all come from, we all come from different places, but we've got to leave here ready to go to many, many places. So any last comment? We're right on the, on the time here. Any last comment from- uh, And a very quick note on that. Uh, what I was describing was a kind of 70s yes. environment. Yes. That by the time we get into the 80s, we really are, you know- Moving forward. Getting into a supportive, encouraging environment. Uh, from conversation to friendships to everything that feels so much better today. Yes, yes. So any last comment as, as we conclude today's conversation? Dr. Dunning? I think as a follow-up to what Cully just said, I have a son who is a professor at the University of Maryland. And when he was going to a high-end college prep school in Atlanta, occasionally I would talk about the University of Alabama and some of the things that occurred. And he would give me this look as if I'm talking about the War of the Roses. <laughs> and, and, I used, and, I, and I couldn't get him to sort of listen to that because so much had changed. So much had changed. He had no frame of reference to connect to something that I was saying that was in my lifetime. And that amused me. And so Cully is right. We have had dramatic changes, but I consider what's going on in this nation, we are always a work in progress, the more perfect union concept. We are always a work in process. Mm -hmm. and so I would get people to understand, to think about this is sort of a marathon and an ongoing body of work. Mm -hmm. and, and viewed as how each generation has to step in and to continue to strengthen this country and to give a level of dignity and humanity and options and choices to citizens. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. And so 
how to communicate that in ways where students can sort of understand their role now. All right. Dr. Clark, any last comment from you as we close out today? No, I've just enjoyed so much being a part of this, uh, getting to revisit something that uh, was a powerful part of my life and uh, to do it with you and all the family that have gathered here. And I gather there's some 150 that may have gathered plus. We had over 200, about 250 oh, that joined us, Wonderful. yes. Yes. Well, thank you both. As, as we conclude, I, I want to share with our audience is a quote that I just absolutely love by Margaret Mead. And she says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so for you, committed citizens, that absolutely changed in terms of our understanding of the history, in terms of what was happening on this campus, I am deeply indebted to both of you. And I thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks to those who joined us online today. Check our website, diversity at ua.edu. We thank you, have a great weekend, and roll tide.